Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Mom Strength. This is Surabhi Veach, and I am your host, and I'm so incredibly excited to have on one of my favorite people today, Emma Jack. So Emma and I met, actually, we met years ago at a conference that was very kind of brief, and I think we have a picture together, and then we re-met years later in the online space. Um couple years ago, actually, just over two years ago, or no, it was like two years ago to right now, right? In 2020, I had just had my second baby and Emma had this post that she shared about this giveaway and was like, let me know what your dream is. And I just like, was like, hmm, what is my dream? So I like put it down and I was so fortunate and I won a month of coaching with with Emma. And at that point, I was like, what the heck is coaching? I don't know what any of this is. And I thought she only worked with people who ran like their own businesses and clinics. So I was like, ah, that's not me. I don't own anything. I'm just someone who's interested in something. And that month was literally life-changing. And I don't say that out of exaggeration because it was actually life-changing for me because I saw that I could take my dream and my hope and actually make it reality with Emma's coaching and guidance. That's exactly what I did. So Emma is a sport and orthopedic physio. She has her own practice, Press Play with Emma, that has now been transitioned to her home her home office. And so she's a physio, but she's also more than that. She is a coach. She works with a lot of physiotherapists and healthcare professionals to help them show up in their lives fully and in their careers in a way that feels authentic, sustainable, and fun. Emma is so fun. And like, she's just like naturally fun. So welcome, Emma. I'm so happy to have you on here. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. That Going back to our time together um, and thinking about that time that we spent together, I just like got goosebumps thinking about, you know, so many of the things that you wanted to bring to life. Like I'm now watching you do all the things and so much more. And I think that's so, so cool because I do remember you talking about wanting to help moms you know, decrease the barriers to exercise, feel, you know, strong again, and like you're doing it. And you know, what's really cool is like, uh, so many of us have those like visions, but we need someone to believe in us until we can believe in ourselves. Like, that's what I really feel someone like you, like a coach who, you know, it's not like you're solving all my problems, you're believing in me. And I, that belief that you had in me, that I wasn't even anticipating because I was like, oh, this is not that good of an idea. But you were like, great. And I was like, what? And so that belief was so big for me. And I um, am so grateful. I'm like endlessly grateful to you for that. And so I want to talk about you and what it is that you do, who you are. Can you tell me a little bit about your story and what got you into transitioning out of doing only physio and sports to also coaching people like us? Yeah, it's um, it's been a full journey uh, <laughs> in and of itself, and so so yeah, I knew I wanted to be a physio from a very young age. I think I started telling people I was going to be a physio when I grew up, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, probably when I was eleven or twelve, and that was born out of me being in physio. I was uh. a dancer and a gymnast and had lots of injuries. And I was obsessed with my physiotherapist. Her name is, her name is, she's still a practicing physio, Hilary Stonehouse. And I just looked up to her so much. I thought, you know, the stuff she knew was so cool, how she motivated me, the like, how we got to be active together. I was just obsessed with the environment. And so I wanted to be just like her. And so I, you know, went into high school knowing that I wanted to do kin um, in university. That would be a great, you know, avenue and help me out in physio. So I got into kin. And then once I was in kin, I knew physio school was the goal. So I pushed myself to get into physio school and get the grades, got into physio school, pushed myself to be like the best physio student and get all the knowledge. Um, graduated physio and got really interested along the way in working in sport. I had the opportunity to work with a football team in my undergrad and during physio school. And so, you know, really wanted to pursue that. So I took on a sport fellowship um, after physio school, took all the courses. Emma's actually 90. That's how she's had time to do all these years of school. (laughs) Um, You know, I, I was just 
wanting to be the best PT I could possibly be. So I took every course, I went to all the workshops, I volunteered, I went to conferences. Oh my gosh, this resonates so much. Until one day, one morning, I remember it distinctly, I woke up and I didn't want to go to work. I was not excited about the day ahead. I was actually really anxious about the day ahead. Things were not, I was overwhelmed. I was stressed. I was burnt out. I was tired. Yeah. And I, that was a huge reckoning point to me. Something that I, you know, push, pushed so hard um, and invested so much of my time and energy in was not bringing me joy. Yeah. And that's when I knew I needed to do something different. Um, I needed the, what I had been doing was not sustainable. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, it's been a long process of lots of different things. I, I really, I went to therapy. <laughs> I, you know, looked at my clinic schedule. I looked at how much, you know, how much giving of myself I was doing. Yeah. And that's when I realized I was, you know, giving a lot to other people and I was giving absolutely nothing to myself. Mm, wow. And we often think about that reminds me of like love languages and how we like show love to others. We also need to show love for ourselves in the same way. And that's something that a lot of, I feel like women especially are givers. And I don't know if we are givers or if those nurturing qualities are just nurtured. So we yeah. naturally you know, when my, my, when my daughter shares her daycare teachers are like, yay, you know, like, so it's like, they learn from young age that they are more liked. They are seen as better when they are giving and we internalize those things. Yeah. And, and I think there is this notion of the, you know, good girl yeah, and, yeah. and, and doing good and not to say like, I, I do love being of service. Yes. But I was never taught that in order to be of such service to others, I first needed to make sure I was good because yeah. when I'm good and I feel good, I can give so much more. Um, and so it's really been a process of learning what it is I need in order to feel good. Yeah. Um, so like I said, therapy, I worked with some <laughs> coaches um, and really got to know myself and, and my needs and what made me tick and what gave me energy and lit me up. And so in that process, I decided to start my own clinical practice. Um, I had been working for somebody else and I realized like just some of the things that were going to help me show up my best weren't possible in somebody else's business, yeah. right? Yeah. And Because they uh, set the clinic culture and if your vibe is so different, it's it's hard to thrive as yourself when you're in this culture that's totally opposing your values or your views, right? Exactly. So I didn't realize that. So you started your clinic after experiencing this, you know, process of burnout, which some people might say, wow, like that's even more work. But how did you find that? Yeah, I, you know, it was the process of getting to know myself better. I knew that my capacity for, you know, serving was actually less than what I had been doing. Mm -hmm. I was not able to give continuously for eight hour shifts, right? So that's one example of something where I was like, I actually can't do that. <laughs> and so there was a number of things, you know, even the clothing I was wearing yeah. was not me. <laughs> no, it wasn't who I was. Like the, the polo shirt and khakis. The polo shirt and khakis. <laughs> or, you know, I had this moment of I was wearing like these dry clean only pants laying on the ground, showing somebody an exercise, being like, well, this is dumb. <laughs> you know, like, what? But, you know, we weren't allowed to wear leggings. Um, and, and really the environment. I am, and, and people who are like this will resonate with this. I'm very affected by my environment yeah. and, and you know, the vibe, the people the smell, around yeah. the people, the sounds, the, the visuals and the clinic was just not my vibe. It was, you know, it was a gorgeous clinic. It is a beautiful clinic, but it was, you know, beige and medical and that's just sterile. Yeah. yeah it just, it just wasn't me. So I knew I had to, if, if I was going to continue being a physio, I had to do it on my own terms. Yeah. And so that's really why I did start Press Play. Awesome. Um, the, the name is is truly after my want and desire for myself to have fun with this again 
and to to have it feel like play yeah and my desire for my clients and the people i invited into my space to remember what it is to have fun yeah. thing that <laughs> gets so lost regret, yeah as adults we, we think we need to be serious and boring almost and like responsible but i'm like you could be responsible and you can have fun and like smile and have joy in your life right and it's um, I think part of it is also the culture of physio school. It's probably similar to med school and dentistry and like all of these like lawyers, like it's very high pressure. There's a lot of examinations. It's almost like this, it's like a bunch of type A students who are all like, you know, you, if you're somebody who absorbs the energy from people around you, like I was, I didn't realize how stressed I was in physio school until it was over because mm -hmm. I was around people who were like pulling all nighters to study. And I was like, oh, should I be doing that? And they were so obsessed about grades. And I'm like, I, I care, but I don't care that much. Like I would rather just like learn. So I, I learn. And, but I started absorbing this and it, it wasn't until my like late twenties that I really realized how much I had absorbed this pressure to perform and to hmm. take all the courses like you, right. You know, show up everywhere, show up to all the meetings all the and, um, it's so much, it's not, it not sustainable. Yeah. And this, it is sort of, again, a bit of like an indoctrination. If you, you know, wh whatever title that is, doctor, lawyer, dentist, PT, it's kind of, if you want to be this, this is how it looks. Yeah. And I realized like none of us should be operating that way. Yeah. That's not, you know, I think, you know, the, you bringing you to your clients is so important and we shouldn't be these sort of robots and me showing up fully as me in my bright sweaters with Whitney Houston playing you know, <laughs> essential oils going like that's me. And, you know, anything that allows us to show up at our best. I know people are getting served better now than when I felt I had to do things a certain way or I shouldn't talk about certain things or, you know, I, I, I really think when we start censoring what's naturally us, yes. we start ourselves. And I had really lost myself in that, you know, just wanting to be the best, um, you know, physical therapist out there. And so it was really a process of coming home to myself and, and my values. And once I did that, everything changed. And what I didn't realize in that pro process was people, I was, you know, sharing my journey on Instagram. I had a blog and I started getting other healthcare practitioners reaching out to me being like, what the heck are you doing different? You seem to be having so much fun and loving life and I'm not, can you help me? Wow. And so very organically, very naturally, you know, I was like, sure. Yeah. Let's, let's hop. I was using zoom before zoom was, uh, <laughs> as much of a thing. You knew zoom before 2020 existed. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So that would probably would have been back in like 2018, early 2019. Oh, wow. You were so ahead of the curve. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea you could be on Instagram as a physio, like doing a physio thing either, like until 2020. So it was all, rock. well, no, I mean, it, it, at the time there weren't very many people doing that. And, mm -hmm. and so I look back now and can see how, you know, starting my clinic and sharing that journey really just like some people did for me, showed me what was possible. Yeah. And so that's how I naturally got into, you know, working with other clinicians and helping them find for themselves, right? There's no, there's no standard way of, of, you know, living and working in your purpose, but helping bring that out in them. And it's, you know, a bit of, I feel like now that I do this work, I'm like, this is the work I was meant to do. Yeah. This is my zone of genius. This is what I love doing. So, you know, as much as I am still treating, I'm only treating one day a week. And then the rest of my week is spent, you know, with predominantly women, um, working with them to build out, you know, what's going to feel really good and fun and authentic for them while also, you know, giving them a sustainable income and yeah. income that they yeah. desire. Yeah. That's incredible. I also love that because I feel like a lot of people find you through like word of mouth, right? Like someone's worked with you and then they're like, you got to check, check her out. And I also think that 
it goes to show that, you know, you probably didn't intend to start that by sharing your journey, but just by you sharing yourself, you created this opportunity, right? And I feel like so many of us are scared to be vulnerable, to be open, to be honest, or even to just like share things that we struggle with. Um, and I feel like I've seen you do it and it's inspired me to do the same because we're afraid of being judged if we share something that's like hard. And instead, I think there's very few people who judge you and there's more people who are like, oh, like you're just like me, right? Like I get it. It's such an opportunity for connection. Yeah. You know, that's the connection point is, is recognizing, Hey, what they're thinking, I'm kind of thinking too. And it does, you know, there is, I think a leadership aspect to that of like, I'll go first. Yes. Right. Which is hard. Um, but I think, and maybe, uh, you may or may not agree. I think that gets easier over time going. I think it does. Oh yeah, for sure. You realize like, you know what? lots of people feel this way and it's almost granting permission or giving people some more self-acceptance that like, okay, like this is within the human experience. Well, and I think, you know, when you're a kid in school and you look at your teachers or your professors, like these all knowing beings, and then you become their age and you're like, oh, they're just like other humans who like have an area of expertise, but they might have bad habits too, or struggle to go to bed on time or skip breakfast. Like they're just, they've, they're working on the same things that we are. And I feel as a new graduate looking to someone with more years of experience like you, it might open that connection, that channel more because they, they're like, oh, you're not just this like senior therapist who knows everything. You are just like another person who can guide me. Can you share a little bit about some of the tools that you see to be really helpful in terms of self-care, in terms of building a life for somebody that where they're truly honoring who they are and their own values? Yeah, there's been some like very, I should never say simple because, um, you know, (laughs) I simple, but not easy. Yeah. Simple, but not easy is exactly it. Um, there are some practices that I still do now that, I really do think impact how I show up and make me show up at my best. So they're not necessarily what society might deem self-care practices, but I think they're really important, at least for me. And I would invite people to think about what really supports them and helps them show up their best. But truly for me, what I'm wearing is very important to me, not in like a superficial way. Well, maybe in a superficial way, but like, I love to feel good in what I'm wearing and it really does switch my energy. So I have, it's, you know, I was saying this to somebody earlier this morning, it was not an overnight change, but I used to wear like a lot of black and kind of not not you. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like I was, I was just trying not to be seen and, Mm. and, um, that was not me at all. Yeah. What I was actually, att- I had so many clothes in my closet that I loved, but like had not really worn. Mm. You no, know? yeah. sure. We all have that item that we bought when we're like, oh, this is really cool. And me, and then you're like, I'm afraid. To Where am I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And, and so I really leaned into making sure like I'm excited about what I'm wearing and feel good in what I'm wearing and feel like it energizes me. Yeah. So that's been a very intentional practice and, and something I, I still practice. Um, curating my environment. Again, I'm very sensitive to my environment. And so I started just with making sure, whether it was in my car or in the kitchen or in the clinic, I was listening to songs that brought my energy up mm. and that I loved and that like pumped me up. Uh, it's amazing. It's, it's like you said, it's a simple thing, but so many, so many of us forget that, right? It just changes your energy when like a good song that you love comes up and you're like, you know, that's, you're stuck in traffic, but now it doesn't seem as bad. You're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm listening to something I love. Um, and it's not normalized in like the fit, maybe now in the physio world, but like before I remember when I first started working, there was no music, there was no, it seemed very professional and like, I was wearing dress pants to work. Like you said, (laughs) that's not me, right? I need to be in cozy stuff. And do you think that it's possible for people to do that while working for someone else? Or does it depend on, like, I think that's something that I, 
I'm sure that I had a question when I was younger. Do I have to start my own clinic or business or can I live this way while still working with someone else or for someone else? Yeah, um, I think that is a really important conversation to have with your clinic owner of knowing what it is that has you showing up your best, being able to communicate that and then seeing if that's open and available. And I have to think that most clinic owners should want their people showing up their best. Yeah. Right. And so if in their treatment room, they need to have a certain playlist going, I think that is possible. But again, that's a conversation that needs to be had. And the first step is really knowing, okay, what is it that helps me show what up this way? Need? And, and, and how can I communicate my needs? I, I can't tell you how many clinicians I speak to, you know, every month who are, you know, feeling done with their clinic, but they've not asked for what they would need in order to thrive. Right. And, and again, and that's not saying that's a, a simple, but not easy, you know, it's a difficult conversation, but it's an important conversation because we don't know if we don't ask. Right. And so absolutely, I think it is possible to curate, you know, your practice and, and, um, your philosophy in somebody else's space, a space. Um, but I think it's really important that you first know what it is you need. And then it's, you know, up to them whether or not they can accommodate that and, and getting that answer is important. Then either, you know, okay, great. I can, I can do this, or, you know, maybe I need to look for another place where I could do this, or maybe I need to build it myself. Right. Yeah. That's really helpful. I, um, you know, you, you'd mentioned your music, your environment. Tell me about your environment because your clinic at home and when you owned a previous clinic, when you look at it, you're like, oh, it's so you, right? <laughs> and so was this your vision? Was this someone you worked with? How did you curate this space that really felt like home to you? Mm, I, so my initial space, I'll, I'll never forget this either. When I got um, at my previous space, I was with the owner of the building and we were talking about renos and, you know, we were going to just repaint everything white, start with like a white blank background. Slate. Yeah. And I looked up and the piping, there was like exposed piping uh, on the ceiling. And there was just one pipe, which I think was the fire, like the, the fire line. It was an older building. Um, like the sprinkler system was bright red. And I remember like red is not my jam, <laughs> which I know it's your jam. And I love that. Yeah. <laughs> pink is like my color. Yeah. And I remember. I, I actually like pink too. I just, I like all the vibrant colors, but yeah, yeah. I love red. Yes. Yeah. And so I remember looking at that and saying to him, could we paint that pink instead of red? And he said that pipe or all the pipes. And I was like, oh, all the pipes. Oh my gosh. And so we painted the ceiling just like, so we did white, but then the ceiling was pink. And honestly, it kind of, it was not pre, very premeditated at all, but that set the tone. That set the tone for like, this is a fun space. Yes, yes I am, um, you know, this is healthcare. But healthcare doesn't have to look a certain way, yeah. right? And so from there, I sort of let that be the pink pipes be my muse from then <laughs> on, right? I, I, you know, brought in a lot of plant life because plants just bring a vibrancy that I don't think anything else can. Um, you know, I was very intentional about bringing in bold, bright colors because Oftentimes in healthcare, we're seeing people at a hard time in their life. Yeah, they're in pain, I'm they're hurt. miserable. Yeah, exactly. And so I wanted people, if, if we're going to have to, you know, go through this hard time together, I want you to be in a space at least you want to be in. Yeah. A space where you walk in and think, you know what, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, a, a space that inspires you and, and brings levity and positivity. And so I think we can really, we can do a lot again, whether it's the decor, whether it's the music, whether it's the sense, there's a lot we can do to have people feel lighter in our space, including ourselves. 
including our, especially ourselves. Um, when we're talking about work environments, like we're spending a lot of our waking hours in those environments. It's really dang important you feel good in your space. But also, you know, I've, I've let that be my guide for home too. Um, translated, translated just into where I live and where I'm spending my time. I am no longer here for spaces that are meh. Yeah. I want to feel good in my space. Yeah. Um, so uh, I designed my initial space. And then when I was moving my space home and transitioning at home, the brilliant women at Articulate Design, there are two physiotherapists um, who are absolutely brilliant in designing clinical spaces. Um, I know they, I follow them and I'm just like, wow, every design is so different like everyone's personality, but they have skills. They, have they captured me perfectly. I cried when they showed me some of the design plans. I could not believe how much they understood me and saw me for what I was trying to create. So I will take no credit for how my office looks today. That was all them, but it really was a jumping off point from you know, how I wanted to feel in my space and how I wanted others to feel in my space. For those of you who, for those of you who are listening, like I'm just looking at like Emma's like beautiful painting and like the gold accents with the, with the doorknobs. And I'm just like, and the plant and like, it's just so perfect. Right. And it's beautiful. Meanwhile, I'm like, I'm in my living room with like kids toys <laughs> and bins. but you know what? I find that there is, even when you're at home, there's certain things that are important to me, like our plants or just like window lighting, like that brightness that that brings. Um, no matter where you are, it's important to be comfortable. And I feel like so many of us ignore our own needs because we're in that serving mode. And we're like, what does this person need? But yeah. also, what do we need? What do you see as some of the mindset barriers that people have to wanting to either do something that they're really passionate about, or maybe they have fears. What do you notice that you, in, in your clients that you work with? Yeah, I think they're very universal things. And that's what I try to invite in and, and have people reflect on is that there are some very innate things that our brain does to try and keep us safe. Right. So, yeah. I mean, how many times have you had this like big idea and then in the same breath been like well but x y and z like no there's no way that there's like happen. a million reasons I, why it won't work that you're trying to convince yourself like that was a bad idea a hundred percent and so i think fear of judgment yeah. is a huge one fear of failure yeah and what that you know may mean or say quote unquote about you um and i think there's a little bit of self-trust or lack of self-trust <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, we can look at other people and think, oh yeah, but they're different. Yes. They, they were able to do that because they're different. And so not having the trust that like, you know what, I've got this. Um, and so just like you said, you know, I always like to have people borrow trust from me. Yeah. You know, if you don't have it yet, borrow it from me. Like I believe in it. I mean, I was there. And, you know, somebody else I borrowed some trust from along yeah. the way. And I think we all need those people. We're not, we're not meant to do life or business alone. Yeah. And so having those people who maybe believe in you before you believe in yourself. Which is, I think, an incredible gift that you can give someone. I remember, yeah, it's the fear of, you know what it is? The fear of judgment from yourself is sometimes the worst, mm -hmm. especially if you're somebody who is like a type A personality or like a high achiever, like you've always got, done well in school, done well, done well. And then that fear of failure can be crippling. And so, and like, you know, if you fail at something, your your judgment of yourself is the, the worst to live with. Not, nobody, your family's- I always find it's so rare um, and- I don't mean to like overstate this, but like most people are thinking about themselves. They're not <laughs> thinking about you, right? They're not even nobody, noticing. Yeah. <laughs> nobody's sitting at home today wondering what you or I are up to and if we're succeeding, right? <laughs> They're so busy in their own lives. Yeah. They don't have time to think about you. So it's really, it's easier to deflect to, I'm worried somebody else is going to judge me rather than the maybe harsher reality of the stories I'm going to tell myself and what I'm going to make it mean about me 
if this doesn't happen. Right. Right. That is a little bit more self-effacing. Yeah. I'd love to be like, oh no, other people will say this about yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, nobody's making those comments. And you're like, who are these other people? Right. Yeah. Other people. Like define who these other people are because it's not your loved ones. It's not your family. It's not your friends. Not um, one person that I know has made a negative comment about me starting my own business. There have been like a couple strangers been like, oh, does that work? Oh, how's that? And I'm just like, okay, you know, your opinion you're entitled yeah. to, but they're too worried about their own stuff. And totally. they're worried about their own fear of judgment and their <laughs> own fear of failure. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I absolutely. And I, I think it comes up with every new endeavor, a new level. You're not going to, I never right. think we're going to and it, again, it's a safety mechanism. So maybe we shouldn't get over our fear of failure and fear of judgment, right? But yeah. I think we can meet it being like, oh yes, here you are again. Of course, you're trying to keep me safe and I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I think new level, new devil. And so every step along the way, I think it's kind of, you know, this universe test of how bad do you want it? Are you willing to grow in order to get what it is you desire? Um, and I think once you're able to get a fresh perspective on that and work with it and see the success, it's easier every time. And I'll say for as someone who's been doing this for almost two years, it is easier over time. And when things don't go as well as I'd like, I don't take it, I don't internalize it in the same way. And it's just like, oh, okay, like these are the lessons that I learned. I'll try it again or I won't or I'll try it this way this, the next time. And it's it's just a journey. Like it's not like, oh, I have to do this by this date. Otherwise, I'm a failure at life, right? It's the stories that we tell ourselves. And um, I can see that. I can see that in, you know, the work that you've done in the group, you know, group events that you've run too. I was part of Emma's retreat in Banff Canmore back in June and let me tell you like that was an incredible space that you know you curated 10 women that were all ready to grow and ready to connect and ready to put their fears challenge their fears and I think that what that's one thing that I noticed with you and with a lot of like you know Shante when you create an environment where people are ready to do that it makes you more courageous yes than if you're doing it by yourself uh, yes. And that's, you know, that comes back to you're not meant to do this alone, right? Let others lift you up and, and help you do the things that are on your heart. Um, I, th I think having community and human connection along the way is kind of the whole point, right? If you, it, it's not going to feel near as fulfilling, you know, muscling it out and doing it all alone. No. Um, then, you know, having a community and a group of people that are cheering you on and supporting you and holding you um, along the way. Uh, so I, I think it's so important to have a community, multiple communities. And it's what's really cool, too, is like not only do they lift you up when you need it, they also like celebrate with you. And sometimes I feel this. I feel happier in many ways when I see someone else who's like living in and I'm like oh like I'm so happy for them right because it's just that type of community and connection that you have and um some of us didn't have that in schools in school it's very competitive and very like to each themselves and you know we had study groups and stuff but the culture that was there was very like driven by marks and succeeding and being the top whereas here I really feel like we all are thriving in our own niches and our own areas and I'm grateful for leaders like you who are curating spaces where people like us can connect. Yeah, it's so important. Can you tell me a little bit about um, soulful business and mm -hmm. what that term, what that means to you? What does it mean? Yeah, I think when I was starting my own business, I had a lot of preconceived notions as to what business was or what business wasn't. Um, and when I looked at some of the quote unquote business mentors in my field and what they were looking at, I just like, I was like, actually, 
I don't care if I have multiple locations. I actually don't want multiple locations. I wasn't looking to build something that was going to get me back into what I perceived would lead to burnout. Right. The whole reason I was starting my business was to have it be something that felt good, that, you know, really nurtured me to help nurture others. And, and so my mission was, you know, as much as it was a service business, it, I wanted it to serve me first. Yeah. And so when I think about soulful business, I think about making sure that, you know, the work you're putting out into the world feels so good and so true for who you are. And so, you know, I do work with a lot of business owners, but I don't have the prescription for what their business should be. They have the prescription. Yeah. It's just my job to help pull it out of them <laughs> and discover for themselves what it is they need in order to have their business thrive. Um, I think it's so easy, you know, it, a beautiful and terrible thing about the internet is that there's, you know, so many messages out there and yeah. there's so many quote unquote ways you should do this or, you know, must do's for yeah. business. And I just, I, I personally don't ascribe to that because I've seen, and you're a brilliant example too, of how, when you really just listen to your gut and yourself, you build something so much better and so much more fulfilling than doing it anyone other's way. So that to me is what soulful business is, is really getting to know yourself yeah. and who you are and letting that be the guide to how you show up in the world. And I feel like it bleeds in all aspects of your life. So if someone's listening and is like, oh, I'm not really in that stage, but like it helps me show up as a better parent. It helps me show up as a better, you know, friend, partner, like all of those things because I know myself better and what I need in order to show up for others. And I shared a post on this. Somebody had said like, oh, in order to be a good parent, you need to be able to self-regulate or something like that. But I'm like, I think that's for any relationship. Yes. <laughs> like healthcare pros, like how many healthcare pros do we know that are so stressed and burned out that you show up to like, I'm just thinking of appointments I've been to where you can sense that person's like tension and you're like, you're working on my teeth now. I'm a little nervous here. Right. Because you absorb each other's energy and we're all just, <laughs> we're not solids. We're just particles of energy. Yeah. We're just all vibrating off each other. And I think it's important to take care of ourselves. And I, I don't think you can, and that's why I've always struggled with, with being able to label what it is I do I when I work with people, because I'm not a bit, I don't feel like I'm a business coach. Um, I probably more trend towards the life aspect of things, because I truly think you can't unlink your life and the work you do in this world. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know for myself and I am sure people can think for themselves times where, you know, quote unquote, life has been hectic, chaotic. Maybe there's, you know, been a massive change or something and you're going through a hard time and how that bleeds into the work you do in the world yeah. and vice versa. When work is stressful and overwhelming and, you know, you get home, and it bleeds into life. I, I really, I don't, when I start working with a client, we just look at like, how's life overall feeling? Work is one slice of that pie, but we can't ignore all the other aspects of your life. And we want your work to be such a beautiful integration into your life. So it doesn't feel like you have to be someone else or show up differently. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Our ability to show up for our lives and show up for our work, both of those are the same to me. Yeah. And I do think that business coach has kind of a, I don't want to say sleazy, but you picture, you picture someone, you're like someone in a suit who's like slicked back hair. I don't think that's what you are either. I think you are a person coach, you know, yeah. it's like, um, but even in my line of work, I don't feel like what I do a lot is physiotherapy or, yeah. you know, fitness coaching, it's like you're coaching the human to integrate these strategies and movements into their lives. And it's not about this technique that you're using on them, especially virtually, you're not doing any techniques on them. It's about like them learning 
about themselves and why and where to fit this in, right? And, and that 100%, I think, is the definition of a coach. It's just, you know, being with that person and drawing out of them what innately they already, you know, know they need to do for themselves and and walking them through it and guiding them through it rather than dictating, right? Right. I, I never tell people how to run their business. Certainly I have, you know, different experiences and different perspectives I can bring, but really it, it's a, it's a self process that, you know, we are on the journey with people. Yeah. And some of the things that you have a program coming up in the new year. Um, I'm so excited for that, by the way, Yay! I, one of the things that you did, I think it was like a half year. I know I'm terrible with names of things. First of all, we'll say <laughs> all that good. right off the bat. All good. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what you called it, something or the other. Um, halfway through the year, remember you had like a half yeah, midway reset. Yeah, See? I knew you had a name. <laughs> midway reset. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you had that, and it was such a powerful just practice in like stopping and like evaluating your year, your, your life, right. Instead of waiting for the arbitrary January 1st or the September 1st, or, you know, just do it and look at your life. And I love that you look at not just the work aspect, but like health and family and like all of the tiers that make up who we are. Um, and if you haven't done that, the audience who's listening, I highly encourage you doing things like that with, and I don't know, you have a, you said you have a journal and guide, um, um, so I have on my website, you can actually just download, it's a free PDF, um, that has what is sort of deemed the wheel of life, um, and some exercises to go through. And I think that process to me is something I do every quarter of like, where are things at? Because it's going to change. Yeah. Um, naturally. I love that. And the, the goal to me is not that we're, you know, 10 out of 10s across the board. Everything is perfect. I love my life. It's really looking at, okay, <laughs> what maybe, you know, where do I want to focus more attention right now? And what needs to shift? And how can I show myself that this is a priority right now? Right. And in such a busy, fast-paced world, I think there's so much value in just stopping yourself and taking stock. Um, I'll give you a personal example. Earlier in the year, I was looking at my family bucket and it was really low. I had spent so much energy into my business and my work. And I, I looked at that. And I was like, at first I felt ashamed. And next I was like, okay, I need to do something because this is not where I want to be. And I'm not happy about this, right? Like that there's two components. And when I redid that in July, it was so much, so oh. much better balanced. And I didn't realize it until I did that exercise. Right. And I was like, wow, this has been a big change. And then of course there's other aspects that are, you know, yeah. the drop and whatnot, but I'm okay with this because this, I value my family more than I value, like, let's say some other things that were on the list. Exactly. Um, I love that you do it every quarter. That's, that's such a simple way to just pause and reflect. Um, for yeah, those of you who don't know, it was, uh, can you explain what the wheel of wheel of life circle of life? Yeah. So the wheel of life is just, um, distilled down and, and don't get me wrong. That is, it is distilled because you are not the sum product of eight different categories of life, but, um, it's sort of eight different categories, um, that you just take a quick rating on, you know, zero to 10, how fulfilled do I feel in that category? So, finances, health, environment, friends and family, personal growth. Um, so there's eight different categories. And then once you sort of have that instinctual number, it's looking at, okay, like why, you know, if it's a four, what's leading it to be a four? Why is it feeling like a four? Why is it feeling like an eight? And really just having that inquiry for yourself and then looking at, okay, am I okay with this? Because that's totally an option. You can be like, you know what? Yep things feel that feels good or you can be like oh no like you know you had that instance of mm -hmm. Ooh, family's feeling a little low it was like, like a two it was like yeah, it was, it was okay. low and I was like um I didn't even have to think about it I was like oh yeah two right like I had it <laughs> and I was like that's a problem right that's For a me. problem and so and so it brings that to the surface whereas when we're not doing that intentional reflection 
we can feel like something's off, right? We can be yeah. going through our days being like, this does not feel good, yeah. but we're not just going to come to that <laughs> revelation. It's because my family that. bucket is two out of 10. That's why, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So it gives you a real tangible way to assess and course correct. And like you said, I think all of those categories are constantly in flux. We can't do it all. And to be frank, I think, you know, the why I got myself burnt out was because I thought, quote unquote, I was doing it all. Yeah. And I think we can put pressure that we need to do it all. And to me personally, I think it's very similar. I always have this analogy about when you're balancing on one foot. When you're balancing on one foot, you can be balanced and still wobbling. Right. Right. And putting a little bit of pressure on the outside of your foot, falling into the inside of the foot, maybe going back on your heel a little bit. And I think that's our quote unquote balance is sometimes you are going to have to put more energy into work. Yeah. And then sometimes you're going to have to put more energy into your relationship with your partner. Right. We're always in constant flux, but it's noting, is that where you want to be putting your attention? Right. Mm-hmm. If you're just putting all of your energy into work, but you don't even like what you're doing, <laughs> yeah. or you don't feel like it's being valued or feel like you're accomplishing anything, maybe it's time to put your energy in a different bucket. Yeah. 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 S- such a powerful exercise. I highly recommend it. Um, I mean, many of the people that I have become friends with have been people I've met through your community. Um, especially in, and like, it's really cool because they're not all in Toronto. Like they're ever, like, you're not, you're in London, Ontario. You're, you know, there's people all across Canada and like North America, North like America. Yeah. it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that you have that, that group and, um, ability to bring people together and what services do you currently offer? Yeah. So I, my sort of bread and butter and the, and where I love working the most is in one-on-one coaching, um, that I just feel like I, I don't know if it's again, coming back to my physio nature of having that one-on-one connection, but I just always think I can get further, faster with people in yeah. a one-on-one container. And I, I love doing that work. Um, so one-on-one coaching, um, uh, containers. I have the um, group coming up in January, which I'm so, so excited I'm so about. Excited. Yeah. So it's going to be a bit of a larger container. So there's going to be more people in it, but I think it's going to be such a great way to kick off the new year. Um, I like, I personally am so pumped to kind of do the work as I'm guiding people too. like, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it as well. And, and gosh, it's already filled with so many amazing people. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then I do have, um, you know, journaling guides that come out every month. So every month I um, send my subscribers a journaling guide, which again is just a cue to pause yeah. and reflect. And, you know, I do sort of have themes that come up in my coaching calls um, that I use as inspiration for, you know, the questions I ask in those guides, but really that's, you know, if you're wanting to do more of a self-guided, um, journey, I think those journaling guides can be a really, really helpful, um, way to get that in. I love that. And, you know, in an ideal world, we would be so in tune with our needs. We wouldn't need to set aside time to do that. But the reality is we live in a culture that is very, um, you know, capitalistic hustle, let's go, let's work harder, more, more, more. And it takes work. It takes time. It takes, um, you know, intentional intentionality to go back to yourself and come home to yourself. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'll add the links to that. Do you know what it's called yet? Um, so I, I, you know what, it's funny you say that, um, because I've gone back and forth on two, but I, I really do think, you know, that it is a bit of a reset. So I think I'm going to land on ready, set, reset. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, and I also like that it's in the new year because sometimes I find like there's all this high energy going into the end of de- December, holidays, right. festivities, get togethers. And then January hits, it's winter, it's cold, it's dark. Our- and then you're like, I'm waiting till April. Like I'm waiting till the end of March, right? And it just is beautiful. Yeah. And so I'm really uh, excited to have that opportunity to learn, grow and connect um, 
in, in the new year. I have some questions for you about yourself. Some of it you've actually answered. Um, what would you say is your favorite book or podcast? Um, that's been like, let's say life-changing. Okay. If I, if we're going with life-changing, I would have to say probably in, I think 2016, 2017, I started listening to Lori Harder's earn your happy podcast. And I literally, I've said to, I've said to Lori before, I feel like I owe her tens of thousands of dollars for having listened and learned and been inspired by that podcast truly in some of my like hardest times that podcast gave me the drive and determination to get myself somewhere else um and so earn your happy uh is for sure something that you know it's so interesting how people can you know, I have since met Lori and that's <laughs> but, so cool. Uh, yeah, it was that's so, cool, so cool. But um, but you know, somebody I did not know at all literally was able to transform my life in such a major way. That's yeah. awesome. I and that's the powerful impact of your work and our work in social media, podcasts, any anything we put out. We have no idea who's listening, if anyone's listening, if anyone's reading, but <laughs> I honestly do think that so many other people have impacted my life and they don't, I, I usually try to tell no. them now because I'm like, kind of nice when you say so. No. Um, but for sure, there's other people that you're impacting that might never speak up or might take them years to, to share, you know, what yeah. they've gained. And I think it's, it's lovely that Lori Hardy, I'll have to check that out because I haven't heard of, um, her podcast. Yeah. Um, the other, the other shout out I would have to give is to Brene Brown. I, I love Brene Brown. We all <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. can benefit from, from a little Brene in our lives. And I read um, one of her earlier books, The Gifts of Imperfection. Um, yeah. early I think on. I've read that one too. I, oh my gosh. I just felt so seen, you know, I, I, so many of, and I had never really encountered somebody talking about some of the ways I was feeling. Yeah. Um, I'm and, putting labels to it and like explaining yeah. why why we feel that way and, too. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that, I, I think more than anything, that book um, normalized how I was feeling for myself and gave me hope. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I have a book, The Atlas of the Heart. It's sitting on my oh. shelf. I only read in the fall and winter. Summer is too that. busy. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm actually excited to get through those this winter. And I love that kind of genre of books, like learning about yourself and human nature. I always think about you with human design too. You didn't bring that up, but is that an important part of how you care for yourself and how you practice and how you live? It definitely has, you know, it's funny. I didn't learn my human design until I had already built my business. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned my human design. I think that would have been, gosh, pandemic years are like really hard to decipher <laughs> here, but I think it would have been in 2020. Yeah. Um, I worked with um, a human design coach, Aaron, Aaron Claire Jones. And more than anything, learning about my human design almost was just affirming that what I had built was, you know, design was for. yours. Yeah. Yeah. Like everything that she told me, it wasn't new. It was like, it was again, just that like affirmation that, yep, what you were feeling was correct. And, yeah. and so it really showed me how well and how in tune I was with my own needs and with my own just nature. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, yeah, it was really uh, affirming and I love sharing human design with, you know, the, the people I work with and, you know, just like with anything, you take what lands, leave what doesn't, but exactly, it's been really cool. And to be honest, I've brought that into my PT practice a little bit too, with certain clients. Oh. Um, I think it can be a really great way to, um, you know, feel at ease with how you are. Sometimes we can beat ourselves up. You know, I beat myself. I looked at other people around me and I was like, how can everybody work 40 hours a week? And why am I struggling? And I made that mean something about me. Yeah. Chris, my human design, I'm a projector and projectors are designed to work three to four hours a day. And they need a lot of rest and they need, you know, they can go hard and, and do really, really impactful work. Yeah. Only be you know, shortened, concentrated. Yeah. 
Exactly. And so that's kind of what I had already built, but I was like, oh yeah, that's why that feels so good. And so I think it can, you know, give you permission that, you know, that what you're feeling is correct and for you yeah. lean into it more. And it's totally fine. Like there are people who are, can work 80 hours a week and feel phenomenal. <laughs> and I, I am not going to judge them for that because that's probably within them. Yeah. Right. So, um, I think it could be a really cool tool. I did. I ordered the like book. I didn't do any oh, yeah. coaching and I, yeah. I'm a generator and like, that's, that's exactly what I felt reading it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is so me. And one of the things that it really talked about is like listening to your intuition. Cause I am a very intuitive person. And I used to think that I needed to like have reasons that are specific. And now I'm like, oh, I could just literally trust my, why am I questioning my own intuition? That's always <laughs> never let me stray. That's a but good guide. It, right. It's been a good guide. And even it's very like interesting because I know even in the business world, it's like, go, go do this and go do that. I'm a person that I, it sounds weird, but I wait for opportunities to arise and somehow they just arrive when, and it, when it aligns, it aligns. Like I'm not somebody who's like seeking out this and seeking out that. I just, I, I have it on my to-do list, contact this and I never get to it because I just hate doing it, but somehow they find me. And I really okay. think that when you sit with your, your like gut authority or whatever, the, whatever the words are, it was very powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Um, this you've talked about already, but what are three things that you like to do for yourself every single day to, for self-care that make you feel like you? Yeah. Um, I definitely start my day getting outside out into nature. Um, I love that I have my dog by my side. Uh, she helps hold me accountable for sure, especially in this dark, cold morning. <laughs> but getting outside, I I get so much energy from being outdoors. So outdoors is kind of a non-negotiable. Um, and then, like I said, like getting dressed in clothes that yes. feel fun and feel good to be in and make me feel more me. Um, and having my music. Having my music going um, is is really important and is is an act of self care for sure. Love it, and that gives people examples too because most people wouldn't consider those things as a tool. And if somebody right. feels as deeply about their clothing or like what wh what they wear makes them how makes them feel a certain way, I think that's a great tool. For me, I have to wear bright colors in the winter. I mm. I definitely am very affected by like my mood, my mental health is affected. So if I am wearing drab colors, it it impacts my mood. Totally. So you know that's something little, but it's or subtle, but it it makes a big big change. Yeah. Tell me what is something that you are super passionate about right now. Um, okay. So I've leaned into in the summer, this past summer, I was kind of feeling just like stagnant in terms of my activities. You know, I, I love Pilates and now that I have my clinical space at home, my Pilates performer is here and, you know, we have a great gym downstairs, but I was just feeling like, kind of like, I need to learn something new. And I looked into tennis because that's like something I've always wanted to learn and do, but like, hadn't really had the opportunity to. And it's funny, I, you know, I was going back and forth, like setting up lessons and something, my intuition was like, no, no, this isn't it. This isn't exciting <laughs> enough. Um, and I, I, it's funny, I had been following, there was a studio here in London, it's called Phoenix, Phoenix Fitness for the Arts. And I was always like, what is that about? <laughs> that sounds like magical. It made me think of like Harry Potter. Um, and they have pole they have it's called lira which is like the hoop which is kind of like oh surfing very cool yeah and it's stuff um and it felt so deeply uncomfortable that i was like oh this is what i need to do <laughs> <laughs> so i actually started learning pole amazing i i and remember seeing a few like posts about it and i was like yeah. this is so cool and so I now go twice a week. What? That's yeah, huge. I'm like, I, it also is a bit of a, you know, once you do it once and realize how hard it is, uh, my brain went to, oh, I got to get better. At that. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I was like, it wasn't a defeat I was feeling. I was like, I will master this. So that's been really, really fun. And it's been so much more to me than just, 
you know, learning something new in a new workout. It's also been a very, I don't know if healing's the right word, but um, interesting process in terms of like bringing out more femininity and yes. more sexuality within myself that has felt like a really uncomfortable spot to be. I feel that um, too myself. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of what is feeling exciting. Awesome. That makes me so happy. I find that sexuality is really interesting and femininity too, because we see femininity as one thing and we see it for one type of person or for, oh, this person really embodies that, but not me because I'm cute or I'm this, I'm not that, right? I took a dance class, a few dance classes this summer. And one of the classes was like heels. And I'm like, it was so hard, but it was <laughs> also like, the instructor and the energy. And I just felt so liberated, to be honest. I was like, I didn't know I had this in me, right? Like it's totally like another side that maybe we try and keep hidden again, that notion of good girl, what yeah. that means. And being in that, honestly, being in an environment of women who are in so empowered themselves yes. and empowering others like the energy in that space is just unlike any energy I've been in and so I as much as it still is edgy for me um it feels so damn good and I think I'm so glad to be like exploring that and interested to see what comes of it and would highly recommend if you're anything like me and you've been like watching other people do this stuff and being like oh yeah them not me try it. I, I have always wanted to try a pole class, but I always felt like I wasn't strong enough in like upper body. It, and like, is, it yeah. is a uh, upper body workout for sure, but yeah. I can already see it. When did I start? I started in August. It's the end of October as we're recording this. I, I've made so many gains, things, and that's why I always, I don't often share them, although I could share them more on Instagram, but I videotape every time because I can look back and be like, oh yeah, I wasn't able to do that. And now this is like actually second nature. So it's so fun. I think and important as an adult to be learning new skills. Yes. Love it. You should share that if you're comfortable, yeah. because I feel like that's something so fun and something that a lot of us, um, in our thirties and, you know, we just start to feel kind of like blah, I, I see it happening. Um, and so it's, it, I feel like it'd be inspiring. If you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? Mm, gosh, I feel like there's so many things right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what's coming through for me right now is societal pressure. Like the the impact of societal pressure and how that dampens the magic and the potential and perspectives like I just sometimes think about how much doesn't happen in this world yeah because we are too afraid and because it's outside of the quote-unquote norm and how we've limited humanity really because of trying to stay the same yeah really narrow box that everybody wants has to fit in right exactly and so getting rid of that like I just think there's so much possibility and potential on the other side of that. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Um, and what would you say is your biggest strength? Mm, not my upper body. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, mine either. I, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think my biggest strength and I have always kind of I think I've always had this, but I didn't realize it was a, a strength or something I was even doing is seeing the story around the story or like seeing the bigger, deeper rooted, whether it's issue or narrative, mm. you know, in PT, I never was able to just surface level conversations yeah people like I am um, because I knew that you know if somebody came in with headaches I knew it just wasn't that they had neck, neck tension or whatever right yeah, yeah. Like, there was more to it and and so being able to see people and and 
problems at a deeper level and wanting to go deeper, I think is my zone of genius. Love it. And I, you, it's in the work that you do. It's in who you are. Um, and I definitely feel that when you're in a space with somebody like that, you also learn more about yourself because you stop, you cut through those stories and you just see what you really are. Yeah, but the truth um, is. And I really felt that in the retreat and Banff too. It's like, I saw that in everyone. Everyone was like, you know, just yeah. feeling more elevated um, as the weekend went on. Uh, I also, yeah, that was, that was an incredible retreat. And now I'm like, I want to plan a retreat. Cause yeah, I just want to, I just want to hang out with some fun <laughs> people, right? It was, it's just so fun. It is, you know, I just hosted another retreat last That's week. That's right. Yeah. And it, you know, I feel so fortunate that like, this is part of how I get to serve the world. Like it is so fun. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a lot of, a lot work, of work and planning. And, yeah. And planning, but, um, you know, I had this moment last week where I was like, oh my gosh, I get to do this. I get to hang out with these people and we get to have these conversations and it's so fulfilling and so fun. And I think, um, absolutely your community would love it too. So I'm just going to plant the seed. I know. Yeah. I, and I've already told myself many stories of why it wouldn't work. So I'm just, here we go. Know. Let's let's also write some stories about why it would. <laughs> there, you there you go. Thank you so much, Emma. You are such a gift to our physio community, online community, and the world. Um, thank you for being you and sharing yourself so openly. If somebody wants to connect with you, where's the best place they can find you? Truthfully, the best place and the probably the quickest response rate is on Instagram. Perfect. Um, so on Instagram, my handle's at Press Play Physio. Um, website wise, it's just my name, Emma Jack, J A C K dot com. Um, and yeah, I would love, love, love uh, to connect with anybody. If something resonated for you, I'd love to hear what that was. And connection is is my jam. So feel free to reach out. Yes. If someone, if you're listening to this and you loved the podcast, you loved some of the takeaways, share it on Instagram, tag us and share it with a friend that you might feel like, wow, they really need to listen to this. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Emma. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.